Hello everybody, this is Truth Toothpaste, and today I just wanted to give you a recommendation to watch a documentary I just got done watching last night. It's called The Princes of the Yen, and it's about the structure of the Japanese central bank and economy after World War II and leading up to the present day, and how it uh, really affected the growth of the Japanese economy. And I found it really interesting. And like some other people have said, I don't necessarily agree with everything it says. And it does a pretty good job of laying out the information without making uh, too much of a preachy judgment about what should happen. Until the, you know, it just asks the question at the very end. It's like, hey, do we think all these steps that we've laid out is a good thing or a bad thing? And um, to, and so to try to give you a, a quick breakdown of, of how it's laid out, uh, right after World War II, of course, Japan was devastated by uh, the war. And they had to rebuild their industry in such a way that... Uh, that, you know, they had to get approval from the Americans for such and such things, and structures were put in place, and you had the Japanese Central Bank. And um, basically, uh, a lot of the Japanese war economy structure was retained, but the Japanese simply redirected all of that effort to consumer goods instead of the war industry. So you had the uh, you know, instead of making, you know, rifles, you would make washing machines and for export, right? And, uh, and, and this was very much, uh, although it was presented as a uh, capitalist system, it, uh, there was a lot of non-competitive practices in the Japanese system. Uh, basically, uh, if... You didn't have the same kind of uh, system where, you know, to keep it simple, like Burger King and McDonald's are going head to head and trying to lower prices and compete and going back and forth. They had cartels and basically they would fix prices. The government would set, you know, your quotas and your market shares and things of that nature. So you really had a sort of a certain degree of an artificial system within the, the Japanese system that uh, everything wasn't being driven by their stock market and determined by supply and demand. Uh, you actually had a lot of government finagling behind the scenes that was determining who got to produce what and, and how much and made those sort of decisions. And, um, you know, when you're starting from absolute zero after a devastated economy, uh, I, I guess there's room for that. You can kind of get away with it because, one, you're not asking to be to innovate anything. You just have to uh, to follow what the, the larger economy really is telling you to do. And um, so, and, and it's a lot more simple. You know, there's fewer moving parts in an economy that uh, just got put down to absolute zero level by by a devastating event like World War II. Um, and then the uh, it goes into this famous period of time in the um, late 80s, early 90s, when Japan experienced its bubble economy. And at a certain point, um, the show kind of uh, puts forward that the Japanese, uh, there was an intellectual sort of movement that was hidden within the central bank that said, you know, like this kind of system can't continue forever. At some point, we're going to have to shift to a more market-driven economy um, with stockholders and supply and demand and things of like that being the determinant for who wins and who loses instead of uh, arbitrarily a central bank coming along and saying, oh yeah, you get a loan, you get a loan, you don't get a loan, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they realized that um, there was going to be economic pain in or, uh, that would happen if they shifted this system, right? Um, it wouldn't be a clean transition. And if they did it openly, they would get the blame for it and then all their positions would be at risk. So uh, <laughs> they did, this is the way the, the documentary presents it, they did some clever maneuvering 
got one of their uh, agencies within the government um, blamed for it, the Ministry of Finance. Instead of the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance got caught the blame for what they did to engineer a crisis. And what they did to engineer a crisis is they just made way too much money available for uh, for loan. And they drove up you know, all the... The market prices, they drove up the stock market, they drove up the real estate values, things of that nature. And then, um, you know, when the time was right, they pulled the plug on it and they managed to pin it on the Ministry of Finance guys instead of them taking the blame. And they managed to sneak Japan into this uh, system. Uh, this new system of, of a more U.S. driven uh, kind of system. And, and we're, it, it doesn't really go, it, it, uh, after that point, it shifts to other Asian countries and kind of shows similar problems in those countries. I know more about the current day Japan than I did, than I knew about the past Japan. The current day Japan is kind of a joke for being the, the largest uh, single, you know, uh, uh, per capita basis, the largest single purveyor of quantitative easing, you know, which is money printing into their economy. And uh, so, <laughs> it, it's a, a, I get a I have a, a, a more modern perspective because you know they've led the charge on this QE thing, and so from my perspective, they still look like a joke. I mean, they they look like a joke in this whatever new system they transition to, because they're literally uh, buying with freshly printed money stocks. They're buying almost all the government debt, and so. Uh, I, I, it's just in the system. Like I have absolutely no idea why they thought this new system would be better. So, uh, and now that I kind of gave you the outline of what happened, I mean, basically, the kind of conclusion the documentary wants you to get is that this kind of state-driven, locally controlled banking, which allows the local government to decide how much money is in a system and artificially propping up industry should be is okay it should be allowed i mean that that's at least what i got out of the um the the video now there's limitations to that though the japanese were able to do that after world war ii because the americans opened their markets to them and so they were able to rely on a massive export economy in order to balance out, uh, you know, any excess demand that their system may have pr uh, presented itself. So it's kind of flawed logic to suggest like, hey, every country could do this. No, every country couldn't do that because every country can't be a net exporter, right? If you're an exporter, somebody else is importing. And if you have an exact balance of exports and imports, it's not going to be a net benefit to your country, um, at least um, from a balance sheet standpoint. It might be a net interest from an efficiency standpoint, but it's not going to help your bottom line of your economy. So you know, it's like, no, not everybody can just print money, artificially boost up your economy, and uh, export their way out of trouble. Um, that That is sort of an artificial construct that leans on bigger outside economies to support your way of doing things at the time. It's not really a long-term strategy. On the other hand, I totally understand their criticism of uh, independent central banks, quote unquote, because, you know, independent central banks want to come along and pretend that they're the the discipline, the good guys, um, you know, that they're the ones that know what the appropriate response is and know when when to uh, uh, extend a hand and when to, uh, you know, to be stern and, and limit the amount of money and the money supply. And if you left that power in the hands of national banks, you know, say like something that was directly controlled by politicians within local governments, and when I say local governments, I actually mean like countries around the world, that they would invariably abuse that power and kind of, you know, end up 
producing an inflationary debt spiral or something like that. Uh, that they they would they would respond to popular demands. Popular demands would it would uh, ask for something for nothing, uh, and then they would devastate the economy by being. Uh, overly enthusiastic with their their stimulation in the long term, which which there's a degree of truth to, right? Uh, I'm not trying to justify that, but th- but this is why there was a gold standard back in the day, right? Because if you just let a government uh, print its own uh, money willy nilly, you got inflation and then hyperinflation, right? And uh, you see this all around the world, whether we're talking about, um, you know, communist nationalization. Uh, So basically, it's like, yeah, I get it. Countries can uh, get populists involved and mismanage their their, uh, money supply. Makes sense, right? But, you know, the central bank kind of presents itself as the end-all and be-all for avoiding uh, political corruption. When this can't be... This is like about as far from the truth as possibility. It might it might uh, shield you from that sort of populist. Uh, well, let's select somebody who will just print a bunch of money and give us a bunch of free stuff. Style of populism, uh, corruption, but it doesn't protect you from the uh, old fashioned. Uh, uh, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Kind of internal corruption and elitism that you get when a central bank picks winners and losers from their ivory tower uh you know those with connections are are the ones that are able to get the money first you know you get malinvestment because we're just handing out money to the same few connected well-connected bankers who caused the previous crash and um you know, and and plus, you know, when you put a lot of power into the hands of a few people like that, you know, you're going to attract uh, the kind of people who like power. You know, the the sociopaths and the people that think, you know, that they're above the law and they can do what they want to do, and you know, it's their right to make the decision because you're some kind of dumb, inferior creature that exists to be governed, and so you get this kind of elitist corruption that uh, kind of entrenches itself within these central bank institutions as uh, as well. And so I get the sense that this documentary was criticizing that sort of kind of hypocritical behavior that we've seen from central banks, uh, especially in the last few years in the United States and, and just recently, that they're that they're willing to, to break all the rules and ride to the rescue when it suits them. But if, uh, you know, if, if they don't like the political, um, the political aspects uh, or if it threatens their power base or their institutions, uh, well, well, screw those guys, right? You know, that they, that they effectively do the exact same things a populist entity would do in terms of eventually succumbing to greed and uh, doing too much and taking too much for themselves, uh, they just do it in a different way. And uh, so I, I get the criticism of this, but I mean, this thing goes through this whole arc of, you know, this kind of, yes, there's problems with central banks and and, and honestly, there should also be problems with uh, with what the, the documentary tries to seem to be promoting, which is kind of like a, a a local democratic control of the supply of money. And so, you know, because like I said, not everybody can use that method. Not everybody can be the let's print a bunch, bunch of money and then be an exporter. That, that, that just doesn't work, you know. Um, so, you know, and, and, and then, you know, is democracy a moralizing agent, you know, maybe it's better than uh, a, a couple of guys in a central bank deciding what to do. But when you get 51% of the population deciding to say, fuck over the interests of, you know, the minority, how is that any better? You know, uh, uh, you know, we could do the mental situations where we have uh, the two, the two wolves and the sheep voting on what's for dinner, right? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what democracy is. Uh, democracy 
is not a moralizing agent. It doesn't make what the government does good just because 51% of the population decided to back it. It might make the situation more stable, but it doesn't make it a, a, a moral solution. And it, it's just going to reap what it reaps in a different way than if a small group of, of people at the top were corrupting it. But here's my main problem. It goes through this entire situation, this entire lengthy history lesson about the Japanese economy uh, and, and various forms of central banking. And I don't think the word gold was said once in the entire process. Gold or gold standard. Like this was made by bankers from a certain perspective. It's like, well, what, what could solve this conundrum that we're in, right? What could solve this problem where like, well, just being a country and producing your own money, um, you know, it, it, it has its limits too, right? Uh, you, you can't just always set up an ex uh, print a bunch of money and set up an export economy uh, and just hand out money, Japanese, uh, you know, post World War Japanese style. That doesn't work forever. Uh, you know, it's limited to a certain political arrangement. And also, if you have an, a central, an independent central bank. It can be corrupt, and it can hand out money to special interests and uh, support certain elites against uh, the will of the people. So, so what solves this conundrum? Well, the answer is gold, right? We used to have a gold standard, and if you wanted to open a bank, you needed some gold on on deposit to back to back your notes, to back whatever paper currency you had, and this served as the ultimate check on both of both the will of the people and the corruption of bankers, right? Because if you didn't have the gold uh, and people found out there was a run on your bank and you went under. And so I, I just really find this odd. It's like, it's like, no, we don't just have these two choices between, you know, governments deciding to print money through a central bank they control and independent central banks deciding to print as much money as they want and, and assign it privately there's this third way that we have historically and you know there's all sorts of naysayers say oh we couldn't go back to, to a gold standard there's not enough of it blah 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 there's always enough of it you just revalue the gold to the appropriate to the appropriate amount knock a couple of uh, however many zeros you need to knock off the uh the old currency and then and then, and then revalue the gold you know and, and the gold doesn't disappear Almost all the gold that has ever been mined is still in existence. We don't throw the stuff away. It's, it's, a, it's a precious metal. So, yeah, it's like we could have a gold standard and then we wouldn't really have to worry about central bankers going nuts because they can't print money unless they get more gold. And we couldn't really worry about governments going nuts because they can't print gold either, right? So that's the one big... Um, downside that I kind of see to this that I get the point it's trying to make and it's criticism of independent central banks is correct but I just don't see how just handing that power over to some democratically elected populace and saying yay print money money for everyone is the solution that's ever going to work really you need discipline in a system and money needs to mean something and for it to mean something you can't just create more of it willy-nilly um you know that, that's just how it goes if you want people to value your money it needs to be able to hold its value and if you're just going to print up a bunch of it and hand it out politically it doesn't really matter if a central bank is doing it or an elected government is doing it, you know, and that's my opinion. Um, I don't know what some of you guys may have gotten out of it, but that's what I got out. But it's, it's a very interesting documentary. Uh, I do recommend you take a look. I'm going to link to a, uh, a video you, of it that you can watch in, uh, on YouTube for free, and it's based on a book. So if you really like it, uh, you know, it's an interesting history lesson. I like just a lot of the B-reel that it has from uh, Japan, you know, it's got all the different office buildings and skyscrapers t uh, taken at different shots of uh, time during the day. And you can see, you know, the billboards with anime girls on them and people milling in the streets and uh, trains and that kind of stuff. So it, it's, there's some 
nice background work uh, within the piece too. I really liked it. And it's based on a book. So if you get really into it, uh, you could grab the book and read the whole thing. But anyway, I, I thought I'd share that with you. If you have, uh, if you've watched the video, uh, uh, what do you think? You know, if you've watched the documentary, go ahead and post something in the, the comments here. And I'd be more than happy to uh, hash out what I think along with you. This has been Truth Toothpaste signing off.